Hi, it's Dwyer, DwyerCrime.blog, also keepingitfree.blogspot.com. Both free sites, one a crime site, one a financial news site. Let's talk about the case of Dr. John Hamilton, who right now is serving a lifetime sentence in prison for, according to prosecutors, murdering his wife, Susan Hamilton. She was strangled and bludgeoned in the family's bathroom. The prosecution contends that Dr. Hamilton, who had two surgeries that morning, went home between surgeries, killed his wife, went to the hospital after killing his wife, and then performed a successful surgery before returning home and claiming to have found his wife, who he knew was dead, because he, of course, is the one who killed her before going to the hospital to do the surgery. Now, this is the case that you may have seen on some popular crime shows, where at the end of the trial, the prosecutor is actually cross-examining Dr. Hamilton's own blood expert, the defendant's own blood spatter expert, and the prosecution asked the question of whether they missed anything. And Dr. Hamilton's expert then says, well, you missed the blood inside of his sleeve. And the only way it could have gotten there is if he was the one who committed the murder. He was the one wielding the blunt object that had blowback that would lead the victim's blood down his sleeve. The jury took two hours, just two hours, to convict Dr. Hamilton of murder, right? He sits in prison as I make this video. Now, let me stop right here before I give my thoughts. Let me just say that if I've missed something, because I know this case is contentious, right? I know the accusations are as bad as they can get, right? A man killing his wife then trying to cover it up. If I've missed something, if I've misrepresented any part of the record, then I hope you leave that information in the comment section of this YouTube video. In my opinion, the theory presented by the prosecution at trial, and they're the ones with the legal burden, right? They're the ones who have to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Well, the theory they presented, in my opinion, should not have been enough to convict Dr. Hamilton of killing his wife. I'm not saying Dr. Hamilton's innocent. What I'm saying is they didn't prove their case. He shouldn't be in prison right now, in my opinion. Let's talk about the background facts. It is Valentine's Day, 2001, in Oklahoma. In the years preceding this day, Dr. Hamilton, who is an OBGYN who performs abortions, he is an abortion doctor, and his wife Susan, who helped him manage his clinic, had been through a lot. An anti-abortion group had held a demonstration right in front of their house. Anti-abortion protesters had protested right in front of their clinic. The week of the murder, the very week of Valentine's Day, when the murder takes place, a militant anti-abortion group called the Army of God, a group who, according to ABC, had expressed support for the 1998 sniper killing of a New York State abortion provider. It sent Dr. Hamilton a fax that was a wanted poster for Dr. Hamilton's arrest. The couple's marriage was also on the rocks. The doctor had a patient who was an exotic dancer. The doctor 
kept in touch with this patient by telephone quite a bit. Now the doctor claims that the exotic dancer who was a patient of his had mental health problems, had claimed to be suicidal, and that the doctor of course did call her often to help her out, right? The doctor's wife wasn't buying it. She came across the call logs that showed the extent to which the doctor was keeping in touch with this exotic dancer. She had confided to friends that she was considering a divorce. The Valentine's Day card that Susan, the doctor's wife, wrote to her husband read, I bought my cards two weeks ago, so I guess maybe they don't seem as appropriate now. But I do love you. Have a good day, Susan. Now let's go to the day of the murder, Valentine's Day. Dr. Hamilton has two surgeries scheduled that day at two different facilities. One is at 7 a.m. The second is scheduled for 9 a.m. Now here's what we know with certainty. Dr. Hamilton goes to the first surgery. He's there at 7 a.m. in the morning. Right? The second surgery is problematical. At 9 a.m., his team, his colleagues, put the patient under anesthesia, but the doctor's not there. They text the doctor. The doctor then shows up and is seen at the hospital at 9.30, a half hour late, right? And he's putting on scrubs and things like that. He's cleaning up to do the surgery. He's his usual jovial self. None of his colleagues, let me repeat that, none of his colleagues notice anything unusual. The surgery goes off without complications. The surgery is successful, but it doesn't take place at nine o'clock. It takes place at the earliest, at 9.35 to 9.40-ish. Now, Dr. Hamilton claims that he learned from a nurse that the surgery scheduled before his at nine o'clock was running late. So he claims, this is the doctor's version, that since it was Valentine's Day, he decided to go home to give his wife a Valentine's Day card, to give her a hug, to touch base with her the morning of Valentine's Day. Keep in mind, he was out doing a 7 a.m. surgery. So it's after that surgery that the doctor had an opportunity to touch base with his wife to wish her a happy Valentine's Day. His former medical partner, Karen Reisig, sees the doctor at 8.30 after that first surgery on the telephone, having a lighthearted conversation with someone she believes is a doctor's wife based on what she hears, right? The doctor at that point looks like he's jovial, looks like he's having a good morning. So, the doctor goes home between surgeries. The prosecution contends that the extra 30 minutes gave the doctor an opportunity, a window of opportunity, to kill his wife. Let me say this too, and it's very important. When he returns to the hospital, 
right, for the second surgery. His colleagues don't notice anything untoward, right? Nothing is unusual. The doctor is still in a jovial mood, right? No colleague at the second surgery notices anything different. But we know the murder is brutal. His wife is strangled with two of his neckties, which are knotted. His wife is then bludgeoned with a blunt object. It bashes in her face. It actually revealed some brain matter. The scene is so bloody that the prosecution argued that the only way that amount of blood could have gotten on the doctor's shoe was if the doctor was present at the scene of the crime when it was being committed. Right now, to get to the hospital where he's seen at 9.30 for the second surgery, Dr. Hamilton would have to have left his house at 9.20 a.m. He lives 10 minutes away from the hospital. His wife, Susan, also had a 9.30 meeting that morning at a friend's home. She, too, would have had to have left the house at 9.20 a.m. She did not make her meeting. When her body is found, her hair is wet. She's nude in the bathroom, a bathroom with many mirrors, so she would have seen her killer. Right? The prosecution argues that she didn't make her 9.30 meeting because she's killed before 9.20 when she would have had to have left the house to make the meeting. Let me also point out that she doesn't have her husband's DNA under her fingernails. In fact, let's discuss the crime scene a little bit more. She strangled with two of her husband's neckties, which would have taken time. Strangulation takes time. She's bludgeoned with a blunt object. I have to call it a blunt object because it's never found by police. We aren't sure what that object was. The killer somehow was able to hide the object, right? So, here is where the case to me starts to unravel, right? The doctor claims that he doesn't discover his wife's body until around 10.25, excuse me, 10.45 a.m. after his second surgery. He claims that he goes home, sees her body, starts giving her CPR to try to save her life, and that he calls 911. When the police get there, Right As they're investigating the scene, they check the doctor's car and they find human tissue in the car, his wife's hair and some of her blood. The doctor claims that after giving his wife CPR, he then went to his car in the driveway and moved and tried to move it out of the driveway so that the EMTs could use the driveway 
when they arrived, right? Keep in mind, he's the one who calls 911, but he didn't move the car. He claims that his hands were shaking too much to turn over the ignition. When police looked at the crime scene further, they noticed that some of the wife's jewelry was placed in her underwear drawers. Right? The prosecution contends that this was an effort by Dr. Hamilton to make it look like a burglary. Dr. Hamilton admits that he moved some jewelry to his wife's underwear drawers, but claims that he did that to protect the jewelry from being stolen by EMTs, right? Now, let me just say this. I believe the prosecution's case is doomed by their claim that the murder took place between Dr. Hamilton's first and second surgeries. The weakness of the prosecution's case for me can be summed up by one question. Where are the bloody footprints at the hospital where Dr. Hamilton performed his second surgery? Understand, the prosecution wants you to believe that there's so much blood on his shoe that he had to be there when the murder was committed. Right? They're claiming that murder takes place before the second surgery. The doctor's claiming that the blood got on his shoe after the second surgery when he went home and saw his wife and was doing CPR right before the doctors, uh, excuse me, right before the EMTs arrived. So let's follow the prosecution's theory of the case. The doctor goes to the hospital. He has a team around him, colleagues assisting him on the surgery, which is involved, right? It involved the removal of a tumor from the patient. So, of course, they're already looking at him because he's late for that second surgery. And yet there are no bloody footprints anywhere in the hospital. There are no witnesses who see blood on his shoes at the hospital. This is after a gruesome death where his wife is bludgeoned, where there's blood all over the place. To me, this would be like O.J. Simpson leaving the bloody murder scene at Bundy, going to a hospital to perform surgery and not having anyone notice his bloody clothing. Let's talk about his shirt, which is also a problem. This shirt was supposed to be so bloody, right? The blood's supposed to come all the way down to the sleeve, right? Some of the victim's blood is inside his sleeve. It's supposed to be so bloody that after the jury heard that the victim's blood was inside his sleeve. They convicted Dr. Hamilton in two hours, right? Dr. Hamilton has a blood smear right across his chest. Why didn't anyone at the hospital for the second surgery notice it? If Dr. Hamilton had to put scrubs over the shirt to do the surgery. Where are the blood-stained scrubs that the doctor wore? How come his wife's blood is not at the hospital where he did the second surgery? Right, think about it. He clearly doesn't have time. Right, he's supposed to be at this surgery at 9 o'clock. 
He has to leave the house at 9.20 to get there. In my opinion, he doesn't have time to clean up. We know he didn't clean up because when the police arrive, after he finds his wife's body at 10.45 a.m., he's wearing the bloody shirt. To me, it's too much a stretch of the imagination to believe that he kills his wife, changes his clothes, shows up at the hospital looking clean, does the surgery, comes home, puts back on the bloody clothes before he calls 911 so they could see him in the bloody clothes. That doesn't make sense to me. Let me just say, no one at the hospital sees him in a shirt that has blood all down at the base of the sleeves. Also, there's the issue of his demeanor. This doctor is supposed to have been a mild-mannered guy who was very popular with patients. When he does the second surgery, he's a mild-mannered guy. Seems jovial. Understand, this murder is so brutal that his wife's brain tissue is showing. It's a strangulation, right? Those take a long time. A strangulation involving his ties. There's a murder weapon that needs to be gotten rid of. There's blood all over the place. How is he able to mentally hold it together? And to actually conduct a successful surgery within minutes, right? The house is 10 minutes away. If he has any fear of being caught, doesn't he have a lot to think about? Right? Will they find the murder weapon? Here I am with a bloody shirt. Here I am with blood on my shoes. Or let's say he changes clothes quickly. He has to be thinking to himself, wow, I hope there isn't a blood stain somewhere on me that I missed. Right? If any nurse, if any colleague involved in the surgery sees some smear of blood on his hair, anything like that, he's finished. He's a doctor too. He should know. If his DNA is under his wife's nails, he's finished. That's not consistent with him doing CPR on a dead body. But yet he's jovial. He's relaxed. So, let me just say this. On TV, it looks like a slam dunk. The doctor's own expert says that he has the victim's blood inside his sleeve. Just ask yourself, though, how come no one noticed the shirt at the second surgery? How come no one noticed the blood on his shoe at the second surgery? When the police arrive, by the way, there's a sliding glass door that's wide open. Anybody could walk in. Right? Anybody could have walked in. Did you know that neighbors noticed strange footprints on their property in the days before? The murder. Right, let's be clear here. This abortion doctor wasn't a favorite of the anti-abortion movement. They were protesting him. They were protesting his wife. The absence of third-party fingerprints 
Does that show that the doctor is lying or does that show that this is a professional hit by someone who might have been wearing gloves? Aren't you concerned, too, that the doctor leaves at 9.20, right? He's seen at the hospital at 9.30 a.m. The doctor leaves at 9.20. His wife's hair is wet. Doesn't that further shorten the timeline? In other words, the doctor would have had to have killed her and then had some time at least a five to 10 minute time period to do things that are evident at the crime scene. There's a rag at the crime scene that looks like someone tried to clean up the blood. Right, the doctor would have had to have shown up at home. He's seen at 8.30 at the hospital. Let's say the hospital's 10 minutes away. So that gives him from 8.40 to about 9.15, 35 minutes to go home and kill his wife. Now let's say this is a crime of passion. Let's say he comes home, he and his wife are having marital problems. Let's say he wants to give her a hug on Valentine's Day and she says, hey, I'm not having it. Our marriage is on fumes, even though in her Valentine's Day card, she says she loves him. Let's say he loses his temper. And he then grabs some blunt object and kills the wife with it. Right? Let's say all of this is unplanned. If it's unplanned, wouldn't that increase his stress level? Wouldn't he be less organized? If it's unplanned and he's just killed his wife and then had to unexpectedly ditch the blunt object, right, which isn't found, right, tries to clean up the blood but then realizes he's going to leave the scene a bloody mess, his shoe's still bloody. He hasn't cleaned up himself. His shirt's still bloody. Does the heat of the moment idea pass the smell test to you? Keep in mind, too, while all of this is going on, he gets a text from the hospital. Hey, we've put this patient under anesthetic. You need to get here to do the surgery. And he's able to make it there by 930. So... Whether or not the victim's blood is under, on the inside portion of his sleeve, right? Whether or not that's so, and understand, he's doing CPR, he's right up on top of the victim, right? The problem with the prosecution's theory is it doesn't tell us why the bloody shirt wasn't discovered at the hospital by his colleagues. He doesn't do the surgery alone. It doesn't tell us why his bloody shoe isn't bloody at the hospital. Right? It's not as simple as him wearing a shirt when all of this happens. 10.45 a.m. Let's say you believe that the murder doesn't take place in the window between the first and second surgery. Let's say it takes place after the second surgery. Well, unfortunately for the prosecution, that's not the case they presented. Understand, they were surprised when the defendant's own expert said that the defendant must have been present to get the blood stains inside their sleeve. Right, they were surprised. Understand too, the wife's not even supposed to be home. She's supposed to be out at her own meeting. There also isn't enough time 
for Dr. Hamilton to come home, put her jewelry in the underwear drawers, right? Go outside to move his car if you believe he did so. Leaving stuff in the car. Going around the house, opening up the sliding glass door, strangling his wife, bludgeoning her, then leaving to hide the blunt object that he used to bludgeon her with. There isn't enough time for him to do all of that after he arrives home from the second surgery. So I'm sorry. A man is in jail right now, and the prosecution's theory of the case doesn't make sense. How could no one at the hospital for the second surgery sense anything untoward? Right? No one stepped forward and said, hey, look at these bloody footprints. You can imagine, because the timeline is so tight, I'm guessing here that the police had to have interviewed the people at the second surgery extensively. Extensively. They didn't see the blood-soaked shirt. They didn't see the blood on his shoes. He didn't leave bloody footprints. His mood. After killing his wife of more than 10 years doesn't show any kind of stress of any nature. Right? He looks jovial. He looks friendly. That's all they know. That does not fit with this prosecution timeline. Right? This case makes for great TV. Unfortunately, when you think of the facts after the fact, it doesn't make sense. They never discuss how he's supposed to have done a surgery wearing this blood-soaked shirt, where his scrubs are, the scrubs he was wearing at the hospital. They don't address any of that. Let's go further. The police claim that after he was arrested, he's in the police car and to hide the cuts on his hands, he apparently starts knocking his hands up against the metal grate. Right? He looks distraught. Is he a distraught guy just wailing away, just lost the love of his life? The woman he's been married to for more than 10 years? Is he just overcome by emotions and he's, you know, moving his hands? Or is he a guy who's trying to cover up cuts on his hands by creating other cuts around those cuts? Right? It sounds compelling when you hear it. You think to yourself, wow, that's interesting. Here's the problem. The people at the second hospital for the second surgery, didn't see him with cuts all over his hands. It's not there. Let me also say this too. Let's say he did this crime in a very short time window. This labor-intensive crime, strangulation, bludgeoning her, hiding the blunt object that he used to bludgeon her. Okay, let's say he does all that. Let's say when he gets in the car, Right? He has her hair on him, her blood on him, some of her human tissue on him. That's how that gets in the car. Right? Well, understand, there are no bloody footprints leading away from this crime scene. Right? None. If he's sloppy enough, to carry her hair and blood and human tissue with him when he's in the car, how could none of that be present for a second surgery? 
right? Again, I'm not saying that he's completely innocent. My point is, in the United States of America, the prosecution bears the burden of proving the case beyond a reasonable doubt. And I don't believe they did that here. I think the jury was so impacted by the defendant's own expert turning on him at trial that the jury overlooked the timeline problems and the evidentiary problems. The eyewitness testimony, understand eyewitnesses work two ways, right? An eyewitness can hurt you by saying, wow, he looked hurried, he looked harried, his hair was tussled, uh, he had scratches on his hands, he had blood on his sleeves. Witnesses can also help you by what they don't see. Right here, you have a group of witnesses who say, you know what, Dr. Hamilton looked like Dr. Hamilton always looks. If you're a juror and you're hearing, wow, he had so much blood on his shoe, that he had to have been there when the murder was committed. Well, where's that blood moments later when he's at the hospital doing surgery? What time did he have to pull off this murder and to then clean himself up, hide the murder weapon, hop in the car, drive 10 minutes and make it for the second surgery where, of course, he does a good job. The surgery goes off without a hitch. So forgive me, I have problems with this case. I know there are those who say, oh, this guy's awful, killed his wife, is trying to cover it up. I was watching a crime show and um, one of the couple's daughters was saying, gee, this is terrible. Why won't he just admit it? Right? Understand. This was a guy who was getting warnings, getting wanted posters from anti-abortion groups. The weak. His wife is murdered. The weak. Also, think of the date. Valentine's Day. If I'm a extremist who wants to hurt you badly, wouldn't Valentine's Day be one of the days I pick to hurt your marriage, to hurt your wife? Right? Maybe the story isn't completely made up. Again, the Sliding glass door is wide open. They had protested in front of his house before. They knew where he lived. Someone could have walked in, said, I'm really going to hurt this doctor. Right? They could have been casing the house. Seeing the doctor leave at 920 or maybe 915 to make it to the hospital. Then they could have stepped in, found the guy's wife in the bathroom, and then savagely, brutally murdered her. What we know is that no one at the second surgery sees blood on the doctor, right? Sees blood down around his, the sleeve of his shirt, sees him wearing a blood-soaked shirt, right? That's crucial in this case. Sees him wearing a blood-soaked sh shirt sees him with cuts on his hands that the cops claim he tried to cover up. Right? That's missing. These are valuable witnesses. Understand, that surgery starts at 940. His wife's body is found about an hour later when he returns home. That's how tight the timeline is. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.